Lift up your voice in song to the mighty one. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. He is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice in song to the Mighty One. Lift up your hands in praise. Fall on your knees at the throne of the Holy One. Offer yourself to the Ancient of Days. Jesus Christ is Lord. So we thank you and praise you, Jesus. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching the program. We believe God has called you to be here. My name is Father Al Lauer, and this is Daily Bread. Our subject for today will probably, if we ever get any letters, most of you don't write too often, maybe you'll change your mind. Our subject for today is a pamphlet that I've written years ago. It's called Fundraising, Faith Raising, and Festivals. This should provoke a certain response, hopefully a response of faith in the Lord. Let's not uh, take the attention off of Him. All right, we're going to just bless you all as we get started. We, this blessing means that we're children of God. That's something very important to remember when you talk about fundraising. Because we have to always do things that are not uh, uh, below our dignity. And we have a fantastic dignity as um, sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, we just pray in the name of your wonderful Son, Jesus, that we would simply uh, be so conscious of being your children that we would act that way, we'd talk that way, we'd spend our, act, our time in a way appropriate to being uh, so dignified, so glorified, so loved as to be your children. Send your Holy Spirit to us. Deliver us from all that is evil. We bring down all the strongholds of the evil one. We ask, Lord, for reconciliation in marriages. We pray, Lord, that we would have a certain peace in our heart, that we'd be completely open to anything that you tell us. Lord, your perfect will be done. Lord, confirm this word with signs and wonders and healings. Those trapped in compulsive behavior, alcoholism, pornography, homosexual activity, uh, Lord, just break those chains, those trapped in other compulsions, masturbation, uh, s s caffeine addictions, nicotine addictions, alcohol addictions. In the name of Jesus, those chains be broken. Jesus, you're the one who can do it. We trust you, Jesus, for this. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, we're going to start on fundraising, faith raising, and festivals. And our opening scripture is Matthew chapter 7 and verse 11. Now you might say, what, what does this have to do with fundraising? Well, let, let me read it. If you, with all your sins, know how to give your children what is good, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to anyone who asks Him? Our fathers and mothers on earth, they love us and they want to do good for us. They would give us anything that would be truly for our good. Now, of course, these fathers and mothers, as good as they are, are weak and sinful human beings. Now, if our human fathers and mothers care about us and want to provide for us and do good things for us, how much more will the, the Heavenly Father do good things, give good things to anyone who asks Him. Now, just like our earthly fathers, our Heavenly Father wants to be uh, considered a good provider. This is how He shows His love for us, among other ways. And just imagine if, um, say, some of you who are fathers who are watching this program, that there was a rumor kind of circulating that you would not... Uh, provide food for your own children. You had the food, but you just wouldn't even feed your own kids. You told them to go out and 
sell chances, uh, get involved in gambling, um, buy a bottle of booze and, and sell 40 chances on it and make a profit of, of 20 bucks and that's how they're going to live. What if, you, what if that was a rumor that you would not provide for your children and you told them they had to do something like that? What, you wouldn't be too happy about that rumor. You'd say, well, that's an insult to me. That makes me, doesn't, makes me look like I'm not much of a father. I don't, that, I would, that I would expect my children to do that and I would not provide for their basic needs. Well, that's, that's the way it is with our Heavenly Father. See, a lot of people think our Heavenly Father, well, that, he's not really our Father. He's just kind of a poetic, symbolic Father. No, he's really our Father. He's just as real, really your Father as, as, the, as the person who was part of conceiving you, as, as a person that weighs 182 pounds and was born in this day and you can reach out and grab his hand. That is how real our Heavenly Father is. You see what I mean? So he, he really does want to care for us. He wants to father us. There's a lot of people who won't let God father him because they don't believe he's really a father. They think that's just some kind of theological jargon or something. And they say, well, God helps those who help themselves. Well, he does. He also helps those who don't help themselves. But the ones who help themselves don't know God's helping them. They think they're doing it. And so there's so many people never, ever found out about their father. So when you're talking about fundraising, you know, you know what you're really talking about? The fatherhood of God. And also, you're talking about um, faith. Do you believe that he's really your father? Do you believe Jesus? Because Jesus came to show the father to us. He says, the fathers love me, I love you. He taught us to pray, he said, our father. He said, as the father sent me, I send you. I do nothing of my own. Whatever I'm doing, it's the father showing me what to do. The father and I are one. You see me, you see the father. You know, you get the idea what Jesus is doing? If you act as if your heavenly father isn't a real father, you know what that tells Jesus? In John 14, Philip acted that way, and Jesus was so upset. Jesus said, after I've been with you all this time, you still don't know me. It tells Jesus, your, your mission didn't work, at least not for me. The purpose of your life doesn't mean anything. Um, I never got the message. Wow, just think if you spent your entire life trying to get, get one point across and then somebody does something showing that they didn't get the point. Wow, <laughs> you know, it's very frustrating. So it tells our father we don't believe he's our father. It tells Jesus his mission was really not, not valuable. See, when we start raising funds in ways that kind of indicate we don't think our father's for real, that, uh, that's a big problem. You say, well, we have to raise the money because we, we need it. The Lord said, I will provide for all your needs in a way worthy of my riches in glory. I'm going to provide for all your needs. So either what you think you need, you don't need, or you're not accepting God's provision. Now, now, God doesn't provide your needs without you having faith. You know, you kind of have to believe that he's going to do it. Like if I told, told you uh, anything you need, you just let me know. I'll provide it for you. Well, for that to work, you'd have to believe what I said. You'd have to believe in me as a person. You'd have to have a relationship with me that uh, would make you think that what I said was something that you should pay attention to. And so... You know, it's a matter of faith. The Lord doesn't just provide our needs um, whether we want it or not. Uh, he does it if we can enter into a relationship with Him. So uh, hopefully you get the idea. And the Lord in our money, He's in, in financial needs, He's trying to communicate His love for us. We need a relationship with Him to enter into it to at least in a in a in a, the full fashion, but the more we enter into it, the greater our relationship, the more we'll be able to receive from the Lord. The Lord doesn't have any problems giving, but we have problems receiving. 
And so one way the Lord would like to help us here is, like, for example, tithing. That's 10% right off the top of our salary or our income. And he says, I, I want you to get to know about me as a father, and this is how you do it. Malachi 3.10, it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me in this. God gives us permission to try him. He says, you're going to learn a few things here. You're going to find out about me. You're going to find out I'm a real father. Try me in this. Shall I not open for you the floodgates of heaven to pour down blessing upon you without measure? You try God with tithing, and you, you find the floodgates are opened. Does that mean you're going to be very rich? No, it means that all your needs will be provided for in very fatherly and loving and beautiful ways. Does that mean they'll be provided for you way ahead of time? No, they'll be provided for you at the right time. Does that mean you won't have to worry about anything? You won't have to. You can worry if you want, but you won't have to. Does that mean you'll have financial security? Yes. Does that mean you'll have plenty of money to indulge all your worldly desires? No. Does it mean you'll have the same standard of living as people around you? No. Does it mean you'll be happy? Yes. You know, that's what it means. So, he provides. But, um, you say, well, he provides for individuals, but he doesn't provide for churches. Sure, he provides for churches. What, what's a church? A number of people united under the Lordship of Jesus. So, um, he provides for churches. Now, if, if you're not seeing his provision for your church, well, it's because you want the wrong things, and if you raise the money for them, you just buy something that would cause more harm to the church than good. Or because you just need more faith. You don't need funds. You need faith. You will receive funds by faith. You won't receive faith by funds. A lot of people say, oh, if we had more funds, we could hire some more people, and we could build up our catechetical program, or we could get more audiovisuals, or we could build up our school, and, and by having more funds, we could get more faith. No, that's not the way it works. If you have more faith, you can get more funds. And if you get it mixed up, you'll notice quite a problem. I'm going to quote here from Haggai. And this is uh, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. It says, um, Consider your ways. You have sown much, but have brought in little. You have eaten, but have not been satisfied. You have drunk, but have not been exhilarated. Have clothed yourselves, but not been warmed. You have earned wages, but you've earned them for a bag with holes in it. So here's a lot of activity, but not much return, and nothing really stable for the future. Does that ring a bell? Do you notice that? In fundraising in churches, a lot of activity, people really going all out, just work, 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 work. Some return, but... What do they, after the festival, they don't, they don't tell you, well, we won't have to have any more festivals for a couple of years. We did so well. No, they'll say, well, we got to raise some more money. We got a lot there. It was very successful, but we still got to raise a lot more. And then you have a lot more. And, and it just keeps adding on and on. Now we, we need a little something more in addition to the festival. Or we need to beef up the festival more. Or we need to have, uh, you know, a winter festival and a spring festival. Or we won't call it a festival. We'll call it a Monte Carlo night. Or we we'll call it a Las Vegas night. Or we'll, we'll call it some sort of Christmas bazaar. You know, oh, gosh, do you notice what's going on here, brothers and sisters? Now, look at the, some of our fundraising activities and, and see if you can picture Jesus there. Can you imagine Jesus saying, we're taking the apostles down to Jerusalem next week, and we're, we got this, I got this ham booth. That would be great for a Jew, wouldn't it? You know? And he's spinning the wheel saying, take chances on the ham. Get the apostles down to Jerusalem. That, uh, that doesn't fit. That doesn't fit at all. What if Jesus says, this bud's for you? you know, I, I don't know. I can't see Jesus saying that. It's not that I think Jesus was just kind of a, 
a plaster statue. I know Jesus was a, as, as human, a really human person. He laughed, he cried, he shouted, he danced. He was just a fully human person, fully alive. But I cannot picture Jesus saying, this buzz for you, you know. I can't say, see Jesus saying, hey, come over there to the beer booth there. I, I can't see Jesus doing that. And it's not because I got this weird idea of Jesus. It's just because that this is incompatible with Jesus. That's all I can say. Now, I can understand that there are some aspects of festivals that are very good. They're really generous people and people doing their best to serve. And, and the people, don't get me wrong, we're not putting down the people who work at festivals. Some of the best people in the world work at festivals. And they're really good people, but I think they really need to redirect their energies. Um, you get the idea? Another point, you look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. It says, avoid any semblance of evil. Even if it isn't evil, if it just looks like it's evil, you should avoid it. Does drinking alcohol look evil to some people? Yeah. We'll say, well, you're always going to find almost everything looks evil to somebody. Yeah, but what if it looks evil to a lot of people? In our culture, just overwhelmed with alcoholic problems, uh, there's no question there's quite a semblance of evil. Some people say it's not a semblance, it is evil. Well, we're not going to argue about that, but we're just saying that whether it's a semblance of evil or evil, both should be avoided. What about gambling? Statistically, alcohol and gambling are major problems for many, many people in our society. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, Take care, however, lest in exercising your right you become an occasion of sin. Some people would doubt, would question whether a person has a right to drink or a right to gamble. I believe a person has a right to drink moderately. I don't believe a person has a right to gamble anytime. That's my, that's my opinion. But, but even if you have a right, take care that in exercising your right, you become an occasion of sin. And I believe that any public drinking, and I believe any gambling, certainly is an occasion of sin. Another scripture, this is... Um, 1 Corinthians 8, verses 11 through 13. Because of your knowledge, the weak one perishes. You know, somebody says, well, I know there's nothing wrong with that. Well, other people don't know that. And they don't know how to handle it. Say, well, just because they don't know how to say when, when they're drinking, um, well, don't, don't uh, bother me. Well, you, just, you, you should be bothered. You're concerned about that. That brother for whom Christ died, is the one that doesn't know when to say when. When you sin thus against your brothers and wound their weak consciences, you're sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food, and I might add alcohol and gambling, causes my brother to sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I may not be an occasion of sin to him. If through our carelessness just one sin is committed at a festival, it, it, that, that one sin far outweighs any good that could have been done. I've seen young people at festivals send their older friends to, to buy alcohol and start down the road to alcoholism. I've seen parish council members publicly drunk. I, I, I know of nuns and priests who started on the road to alcoholism at parish festivals. Just ruined their lives and ruined their ministry. I've seen uh, fathers gamble away their, their grocery money for their families at parish festivals. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, he gambled away someplace else if he didn't do it at the festival. These kids get their booze someplace else if they didn't get it at the festival. That's true, probably. But that gives us no reason to have that. Uh, with using that rationale, we might as well uh, sell, sell drugs and have, have uh, prostitution and say, well, they're going to go some other place. Yeah, but, yeah, but this is wrong. It doesn't matter if they're going to go some other place. This is wrong. 
And then in addition to that, Catholics are scandalizing people of other denominations. This is a scandal. And say, well, that's those Protestants' hang-ups. Well, even if it is, we should love them enough to not scandalize them. Now, a lot of people say, well, if we don't do, raise money, we'll go broke. Uh, no, you're, you're going broke. You're going bankrupt spiritually already. Your father, I, we'll go back to where we started. Your father will take care of you. And say, no, no, he won't. I remember I was at a parish and uh, I saw the bingo there and I thought, oh gosh, we need that one to go. But um, I was new there and I thought, you know, Maybe I'm going to have to just kind of pray and just seek God's will about when to do this, when to change this, when to drop this. Well, they came to me just a couple of weeks after I was there and said, Father, we hate to tell you this, but gosh, we don't have enough workers for bingo, and you're new here, and we make you feel like, uh, you know, like you're going to go bankrupt, but we, we just can't do it. We're too old. We don't have enough workers. And I, I was so gracious. I said, oh, that's okay. You know, that's wonderful. <laughs> And they said, oh, he was so understanding. I thought he'd be mad. Well, <laughs> oh, it was the answer to my prayer. And then we had the festival. I was really not too keen on the festival, but here I am, a new person. I didn't feel like going in there and say, here, my name is Father Lauer, and the things that you're working on, forget this, forget this, forget this. So, so I thought, well, you know, I, I can't just, just come in there like gangbusters. So I said, well, um, you know, you already got this planned and everything, so... I'm not really too keen on this, but I'm not going to just come in there and change everything immediately. Well, after the festival, I saw a couple of parish council members just stone drunk, you know, right in front of everybody in the parish. And I said, this is it. You know, I didn't feel like God wanted me to change it right away because I was new. But uh, now I figure this is it. So I said, there won't be any more festivals. And there will be no raffles. And, you know, people said, wait a minute, you know, what are you doing? This church is going to, bank, going to go bankrupt. They said the church is going to go bankrupt. You know what happened a year later? We had more money in that church than we ever had before. You say, well, you just had all these rich people. No, it was very poor. Almost everybody was on welfare. You say, well, how'd you do it? We just had a few people tithing. Very few, just a few, though. And then... Um, and then a lot of people said, well, you just had a lucky year. You just happened to get a few, few extra special donations, and, and uh, you know, it's not going to work another year. You, we knew you'd be bankrupt in one year, and, well, it turned out that you weren't bankrupt, but, uh, but you're going to be bankrupt in one more year. See, they didn't understand. The Father is really the Father. And... Um, you know, the Lord says he, he wants to do so much for us. He wants to love us. He wants to father us. He loves a cheerful giver. It just gives him opportunities to, to, to just really communicate his love. Uh, but we've got to be givers and not just manipulated into parting with our money. You know, the various um, um, fundraising techniques, uh, that's not giving you know, when you, you're not really giving to the church when you're playing bingo necessarily. You're, why don't you just give it straight? Certainly, well, you might say you're giving, but I wouldn't say you're a cheerful giver. You say, well, I'm cheerfully playing bingo. Well, you're a cheerful bingo player, but I wouldn't call you a cheerful giver. If you were a cheerful giver, you'd just give it straight. You wouldn't need any other incentives. If you were such a cheerful giver, what do you need any, anything else? For. Say, well, I like to do this and this and this. Well, see, you're wanting some kickback on it. You're wanting some, some, something out of it. Well, that's not giving. That's receiving. And there's nothing wrong with receiving. But God says he loves the cheerful givers. And so that ruins the, the, the tremendous opportunity God would like to have to just love you. Now, let me get into a few little practical points. What do you do about a festival? If you're not in charge and you really can't control it too much, I would make a strong move to take alcohol out of the festival and, if possible, gambling. But if you can get alcohol out, that would be a gigantic step in the right direction. Now, that isn't really adequate, but at least it's a great step. If you can get alcohol and gambling out, well, 
probably the festival wouldn't survive, or if, it, or if it did survive, it would probably not be that harmful and maybe even good. But get the gambling out and the alcohol out. Now, if you can't do that, well, I would at least talk to your pastor about it and, and, and write him a note. And, and don't condemn him and don't give a big theological thing. Just share what's in your heart. Say, Lord, say, uh, Father Smith, I just uh, pray about this and I've been involved in the church and you know I'm committed to the church, but I, I just don't see God leading, leading the church in that way. And then put a check in that little note uh, that w what you would have spent on the festival and generously support faith ministries that that uh, operate properly and don't go to the festival and then pray for the strongholds of the evil one to be brought down you'll be surprised that as you bring this up instead of people saying well you know everybody's got their own thing if you don't agree with that well you don't agree with it who cares everybody's got their own opinion they won't take this very tolerant cavalier attitude. They'll think you denied the Trinity, the Incarnation, and, and told Mary she was no good. They will really be down on you. Say, wait a minute. All hell's breaking loose. What's the trouble with? All hell's involved here. You're dealing with a principality, a power, a prince of darkness. You're dealing with the devil. Your battle not against human forces. It's not the pastor. It's not the parish council. It's not the, the workers at the festival. This, you're dealing with the devil here, and all hell starts breaking loose. But remember, the one in you is stronger than the one in the world. Remember, you have victory over the evil one. You have authority over the evil one. But you have to understand, this is not just a matter of opinion. This is not just a detail about fundraising. You eventually get into actual warfare with demons, called spiritual warfare. It's pretty important to get that point across. Now, the reason we're sharing all this is not to give festival workers a hard time. As I say, some of the best people in the world are festival workers. But in order to uh, lift up our Heavenly Father's love and let the church be the church, okay? Let's pray right now. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that we, through our prayers, through our sharing with our pastor, through our contributions, and through our faith in you, make a big change in this whole area of festivals and fundraising. We pray all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. To the ancient of days, he is the light that shines in the darkness. He is the rock that stands. Glory and honor and power be unto the Lamb. Lift up your voice.